there is no benefit at all in discussing this controversy uh, amongst the public. I am strongly against ignoring the bigger problems out there and just teaching these half Sunday school myths. Will the real Yasser Qadi please stand up? Many Muslim apologists will shy away from difficult questions, dodging them entirely or giving half-truths at best. To his credit, Yasser Qadi is often not among them. For example, in the following clip, he celebrates the fact that Islam was spread primarily by the sword. There is a reason why the political strength of Islam followed the ideological and theological conversion. If you understand what I'm saying, if you don't, then think about it. There is a reason why the borders of the Muslim world today are essentially the borders of the Umayyad and Abbasid and Ottoman empires. And by the way, please don't quote me Malaysia and Maldives and whatnot. Please don't say, oh, look at those. Because firstly, they were exceptions. And secondly, do you know how those exceptions occurred? How did Malaysia become a Muslim land? How did the Maldives become a Muslim land without the political dominion of Islam, you know, get what I'm saying here, uh, reaching them? How? Their rulers converted to Islam. When their rulers converted to Islam, the people were essentially socially forced to follow. Sometimes politically, by the way, but socially forced to follow. And then he criticizes those who claim otherwise saying these half-truths cause people to leave Islam. We don't have the luxury to be in our beautiful bubbles anymore. Because of the internet, I am strongly against ignoring the bigger problems out there and just teaching these half-Sunday school myths because, maybe because of who I am, but I have experienced too much disenfranchisement from the next generation. I have talked to too many people who have left the faith of our own children. And they say to me, we were taught lies. We were taught untruths. It's not correct what we were taught. The fact that Islam was spread by force is certainly a controversial idea in the West. Most Muslims who want to reach Westerners would prefer to deny it. But Qadi embraces it. However, when asked about a seemingly benign topic, the fate of Muhammad's parents, he took a completely different tone. There is no benefit at all in discussing this controversy uh, amongst the public. Nothing is to be gained, whether they went here or they went there. What gives? Is Qadi just a massive hypocrite who's happy to embrace controversial topics when he thinks he has an answer, but wants to shut up all debate when he has none? Mm, perhaps. But I think there's a better explanation. Let's take a look at Qadi addressing perhaps the most controversial topic of all. Why Muhammad married a child and had sex with her when she turned nine. Oh, Muslims, don't apologize for the truth and don't distort the truth. There are, there are Muslims that try to deny this. Oh, he didn't marry Aisha as a young girl. Ya akhi, look, that's not the way forward. We don't lie for the sake of our religion. Astaghfirullah. We have the truth. We're not going to cover up the truth if people find it embarrassing. This is the reality. Deal with it. Our Prophet married a young girl, and it was fine for the time. Oh, why shouldn't Muslims be embarrassed about Aisha? Because it's true. And why should Muslims be proud of the Islamic conquest? Because it's true. But, as Pilate famously remarked, what is truth? That is the heart of the matter, and it turns out to be the key to understanding Qadi's apparently contradictory stances. Since at least the time of Aristotle, most philosophers, and for that matter people in general, have held some sort of correspondence theory of truth. That is, for a statement to be true, it must correspond to something that exists in the real world. A statement like, chocolate ice cream is cold, or chocolate ice cream is brown in color, is a truth statement because it corresponds to an objective state of reality. Chocolate is the best flavor of ice cream, is not, however, because being best is a matter of opinion, not objective fact. Muslim scholarship, and presumably Yasser Qadi, hold to something different, 
a consensus theory of truth. Under consensus theory, what is true is what a consensus of either qualified individuals or the entire community holds to be true. This is exemplified in the Hadith where Muhammad is claimed to have said, Allah does not gather my ummah upon deviation, and it is codified in the Sharia law. There are many hadiths that have come from the Prophet, as well as quotes from the companions which indicate that the community is divinely protected from error. And who decides what the community consensus is? In Islam, that would be the scholars. Therefore, when consensus exists, the ruling agreed upon is an authoritative part of sacred law that is obligatory to follow and not lawful to disobey. Nor can mujtahids of a succeeding era make the thing an object of a new ijtihad, because the ruling on it, verified by scholarly consensus, is an absolute ruling which does not admit of being contravened or annulled. Indeed, to deny the scholarly consensus is akin to the worst disbelief. Someone raised among Muslims who denies something upon which there is scholarly consensus, ijma, thereby becomes an unbeliever, kafir, and is executed for his unbelief. Qadi knows this. He also knows that there's never been any scholarly disagreement about the age of Aisha or the permissibility of waging war to spread Islam. He knows, therefore, that a Muslim cannot deny these things and remain a true Muslim, according to the Sharia. The fate of Muhammad's parents is another matter, however. Qadi explains. This is a uh, theological controversy that goes back to the second, third generation of Islam. And you have great ulama that said both opinions, one on this side, one on that side. You had ulama that held uh, both of these positions throughout Islamic history. You see, there's no consensus on this matter. So there is no truth. That makes Qadi nervous. And for good reason. You might think that it's a simple matter, that the Muslim can decide for themselves what is right and agree to disagree. But this is Islam, so that is not an option. The individual cannot think for themselves because they aren't qualified to make that judgment. Worse, the uninformed may begin to doubt, and doubt is extremely dangerous in Islam. The Prophet said, the dead person ends up in his grave. Then a window to hell is opened for him, and he sees it, parts of it destroying others, and is said to him, This is your place. You were doubtful. In this state you died, and in this state you will be resurrected. Islam QA puts it bluntly. Whoever has doubts about anything that has reached him of what Allah said in the Quran or that was conveyed by his messenger, is a disbeliever. Doubt makes one an unbeliever. For this reason, the Sharia makes anything that could cause doubt unlawful knowledge. Unlawful knowledge includes anything that is a means to create doubts. Back to Qadi. Yes, let the scholars discuss amongst themselves. There might be some benefit here and there amongst them. Yes, let the full-time seminarians that are studying Islam full-time, let them study the controversy from a historical, theological perspective. But the position that I advocate, there is no benefit in bringing up these issues in khutab, in durus, in these public Q&As. And you as an average person, you are very disturbed about this. I say, don't worry about it and continue following whichever position your initial teacher taught you. It is okay for scholars to discuss these matters because it won't cause them to doubt. But the common Muslim might doubt if they learn the truth. So it's best they not think about it and just be happy in their ignorance. With this in mind, we can take another look at why Qadi was so evasive in his now famous interview with Hijab. The issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them these are very, very difficult issues. And 
the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered yeah. questions in there. My point being that this issue uh, of Ahruf and Qiraat has troubled the Ummah from the very beginning of times, nothing new. And there are 15 opinions about this. None of them fully answer all of the questions that are raised. Some of them answer more than others. So the issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. There is no consensus on Aruf. Indeed, there are more than 15 opinions. Worse, none of them really work from an objective standpoint either. So there's no hope of consensus emerging. In other words, Muslims have no truth on this matter from either a consensus or correspondence theory point of view. Learning this might cause doubts. Indeed, it caused Qadi himself to doubt. Wallahi, I'll be honest with you. The shubuhats that I was exposed to at Yale, some of them I still don't have answers for. What was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked. Since there's no truth and doubts are dangerous, it's better for the Muslim to just blindly submit and not think. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ta'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. But here's the thing. Qadi is actually right. We're not going to cover up the truth if people find it embarrassing. Islam has some truth to offer. It has the truth that the perfect example for all humanity to follow bedded a child. It has the truth of political power. It has the truth of being spread by the sword. But it doesn't have any truth where it matters. It does not stand up to scientific, historical, or moral scrutiny. It doesn't have any real answers to offer. Just a carnal promise of a heavenly brothel and the fear of punishment for leaving. That isn't real truth, no matter how many Muslim scholars agree. I suggest any Muslim watching abandon the blind obedience to so-called scholars and start thinking for him or herself. Pursue objective truth wherever it leads you, and you'll have nothing to fear or be embarrassed about. Thanks for watching.